Every year I give you an update on regimens and trials and so on. So I thought this year uh, wanted to focus on some of the trials that have breakthrough potentials. Either they're going to change uh, therapy or uh, change the way we approach patients, but that they have a breakthrough potentials. And of course, these tend to be the higher risk uh, uh, studies. And I'm going to uh, review uh, three areas. Uh, one that, uh, you know, it's a familiar to all of you. Uh, it has been our interest over the years to uh, do research in recurrent focal. It's, um, it's been pretty frustrating. And so at least historically, over a few years, we get very active, we do a lot of stuff, and then we get nothing, and then we publish some papers, and then we don't do it until there is some other s group that shows that, oh, maybe they have discovered the uh, factor. Then we get interested all over again, and then uh, after some frustration, we say, okay, we're gonna leave it. Uh, I, I think this time we're sort of, especially with many on board, we're really engaged for real in trying to come to the bottom of that, and I'll, I'll give you some example of what we're trying to do. Second is to modulate the immune system with cells, in particular T cells. Uh, Sandy Feng is doing this uh, uh, in the liver and we're doing it in the kidney, which is always a more difficult organ to tolerate. And the other initiative that we're really interested in is to introduce precision medicine to transplantation. Oncology of certainly has adopted precision medicine for a long time. This has not been the case in, in transplantation and I, it's something that uh, we're starting to work on. <coughs> so in terms of uh, FSGS, uh, a few years ago, uh, Dr. Reiser published a very nice, very important paper, Nature Medicine, suggesting that, uh, actually the title of the paper was that uh, SUPAR, the soluble urokinase uh, uh, react, um, receptor, uh, is the circulating factor. And the nice thing about this, uh, the, his paper was that, uh, n first of all, of course, showed that patients who had uh, FSGS had higher levels of, the, of SUPAR in their blood. Then they showed that patients who had, then patients who did not have focal in native kidneys. And then he showed that patients who underwent transplantation, those who recurred pre-transplant had higher levels of SUPAR. But went beyond that and showed what is the role of SUPAR in, in FSGS. And SUPAR bound uh, to a beta-3 integrin, which then activated two of three GTPases. These are the uh, controllers of the motility of the cytoskeleton or the podocyte. And so uh, these two GTPases uh, increase the motility of the, uh, decrease the stress fiber of the cytoskeleton, increase the motility of the podocytes, and that's why it becomes effaced and produces proteinuria. So we got really excited when we read this paper because one of uh, a group at UCSF had developed a paper on, uh, had developed an antibody and published about it against SUPAR. We said, well, we have the cure within reach. Uh, the, the couple of uh, drug companies gave us grants to study it and to start you know, developing the drug, they said, well, we have a small condition. Uh, just duplicate this finding, show us that in fact, patients with FSGS have high super. So we said, well, that shouldn't be a problem. As we're starting to do our, our work, there were a number of publications that came out that showed that super, elevated super per se, uh, was not associated with FSGS and certainly did not discriminate between recurrent and non-recurrent. So, uh, you know, that was, of course, a big letdown. Uh, and, and so the next thing that came about was a, an article in, tra uh, trans uh, in um, Translational Science by Minnie Sarwal and her group on defining autoantibodies against CD40, 
as being associated with FSGS and recurrent FSGS. And maybe I can call many to actually discuss the finding of, uh, of the study because that's an area now that we are also investigating. Thank you, Flavio. So um, I just wanted to point out, it's actually quite interesting. The field was uh, rife with the whole story of SUPAR. We were actually looking at other circulating um, antibodies in the sera with the idea that if you have FSGS, it is probably some kind of humoral circulating factor. And so that's what got us to look at this. And at the same time, there was uh, data coming out of Boston that maybe um, you know, some co-stimulatory molecules, such as B7, uh, may also be in, uh, implicated in the whole pathogenesis of SUPAR. So I just wanted to highlight that on this paper that we actually published, we have all three groups actually co-authors on this. So we have Riser's group that was actually talking about SUPAR, and we actually have uh, the, um, the Miami group that was actually talking about B7, which is George Burke and Alyssa Fornoni. Um, so it, it's essentially it was a coming together of everybody to say, you know, what are these circulating factors that we can look at? And so we approach this by taking sera from patients with and without recurrent FSGS, and we actually looked at human protein microarrays that have 9,000 human proteins that are GST tagged, full length proteins in insect cells. And then we probed the sera of these patients across these 9,000 proteins in a very unbiased way to ask, could we assess if there are indeed novel circulating antibodies to human proteins or antigens that could be implicated. So that was a kind of hypothesis. And we all know why this is such an important problem to address because recurrence after kidney transplantation uh, can occur if you have primary FSGS in about 20 to 40 percent in the first transplant and up to 70 to 80 percent in the second transplant. Um, it's essentially manifested by massive proteinuria hours to days after trans implantation with impaired renal function and these survival curves show that it's really bad news if you have recurrence of this disease. Um, so really to try and better understand, as, I've, as I initially said, the mechanism of injury, but to also try and stratify if indeed we could develop biomarkers prior to engraftment to try and assess which patients could be at risk. And if, if indeed we could understand something about the pathophysiology of this condition, could we actually have some better rational drug design? And so for patient selection, uh, in this study, we had 97 adult and pediatric patients. You saw that there were many authors across three different continents that actually participated in collection of these patients. Uh, these were very carefully selected patients with just primary FSGS. Um, kidney transplantation ranged from 2000 to 2010, so over a decade. And you can see this came from four centers from uh, France, uh, from John Hopkins, uh, from Stanford, as well as from Leuven in Belgium. And recurrence diagnosis in every case was made by biopsy as well as presence of glomerular nephrotic range proteinuria. And you can see in this cohort, this was pretty aggressive recurrence, uh, really occurred quite early with massive proteinuria. And so for assessment of these patients, we actually had availability of sera that was collected from all these patients before transplantation and then at one year after transplantation. And I hasten to add that even though all of these investigators used a lot of different technologies for treatment of their patients, such as phoresis, IVIG, rituxan, IV calcineurin inhibitors, there was only partial response. I mean, nobody really completely responded, um, and some of them were better control than others amongst this cohort. So this is a very busy slide. I'm not going to go into the details, but suffice to say that it was a pretty long study. This took about six years of work. Uh, so you can see right on top there, we actually did um, these uh, proto-rays. So we took uh, 10 patients who had very clearly defined primary FSGS and they recurred after transplant, and 10 patients who had very clearly defined primary FSGS with the criteria I showed who did not recur after transplant. And the idea was, could we find a difference in autoantibodies in the sera. And I'm kind of running through that first part, but really you, you get a lot of noise. So you get a lot of autoantibodies. And of course, these autoantibodies could be due to viral antigens. They could be if you had 
you know, rheumatoid arthritis in addition with your FSGS. And so really trying to understand what autoantibodies could be of relevance. We actually mapped them to microdissected compartments of the kidney. We enriched for glomerular antigens. We re-annotated the entire platform. And suffice to say, we came up with our top list of about 10 autoantibodies. These were then validated in an independent set of patients that came from that cohort of 97 patients. We did cross-sectional analysis and then also serial longitudinal analysis at one year post-transplant in the new validation cohort. Uh, we then also asked if indeed some of these antibodies were pathogenic. So we took, in fact, the top hit, which was antibody to CD40, and we put it on human podocytes in cultures, and we looked at if there was a change in morphology. We also asked if this could indeed be a novel drug target by blocking that antibody, and we did that in vitro in human podocytes as well as in vivo by inducing proteinuria in mice by infusing these human antibodies. So that kind of really uh, summarizes six years of work, I think, in this slide. Uh, and I just want to show that this essentially is the panel of antibodies that we looked at in the validation cohort, that was the step two that I pointed out. So the blue line really separates day zero and one year. Um, and then really that's the tag at the bottom. So in gray were patients with who had come to transplantation who had ESRD but not due to FSGS. In black were patients who had come to transplant with primary FSGS and then had recurred after transplant. And then in white were patients with primary FSGS who did not recur after transplant. And you can see across these panel of antibodies, seven of them are shown here, but there was an entire panel of 10. And you can see that CD40 right up top so you can see there's an increased titer of these antibodies in patients who did recur. But very interestingly, if you move across the blue line to all of the antibodies, you can see that the levels of these antibodies, even at one year post-transplant, and again, I have to remind you that none of these patients are in complete remission, um, the, these levels of these antibodies really seem to not be very different from the pre-transplant antibody titers, even though they continue to be overall higher than the titer of these antibodies in patients who did not recur. So just just to give this an acronym, we call this the FAST panel or the FSGS antibody serological test. And you can see when you do uh, statistics across this and you develop ROC curves, you can see that you can get this to a pretty high accuracy. So to us, this was exciting that you could run this panel of antibodies prior to transplantation and based upon the combined uh, presence of all of these antibodies and the higher titer of these antibodies, uh, say with a higher level of certainty if these patients were in the bucket to have a high risk of recurrence or maybe a lower risk of recurrence. So but to look at the biology of this, you can see that the antibody that drives the curve even on its own the most in this at about an AUC of 77% was basically the antibody to CD40. And this, of course, was exciting for us because this is a druggable target. And in fact, Novartis, Bristol, and many other uh, pharmaceutical companies were all looking at this as a druggable target for various other diseases. And so therefore, and commercially available antibodies to this target actually already existed. And so this is showing to see whether this antibody could be pathogenic. So this antibody was actually infused into mice. And you can see if we took a control antibody, which means antibody from a patient who did not recur, and you actually added SUPAR to it because we were also interested to see if there was synergy with this antibody. Uh, because I'm, I'm kind of skipping a step that when we infuse this human antibody into mice alone, it caused some proteinuria. But when we actually infused it with SUPAR, it caused greatly magnified proteinuria. So in this model, we are actually testing it with SUPAR. So you can see on the left, you can see uh, this electron microscopy shows really nice preserved foot processes. If you're actually taking the antibody but not from uh, the recurrent patient, here you can see the foot processes are nicely preserved. But on the right here, you can see if the antibody is taken from the recurrent patient and infused with SUPAR, um, and there's a protocol for this, but it's in the paper, you can see that you can start to see on EM that there is actually uh, uh, abrogation of the, of the beautiful foot process stuff with effacement of it over, over here. And this basically shows you that if we basically have developed a model in the lab, which is taking um, uh, uh, essentially uh, immortalized human podocytes, which on the left is control, 
Over here is a recurrent FSGS, just the antibody, and then you can see if you, the, there is basically disorganization of the actin cytoskeleton, which is shown over here in the graph here. So you can see the F actin MFI nicely preserved in the control. When you give the antibody, you basically get, uh, probably with the lights, it's not as visible, but you can see that there is disorganization of the actin cytoskeleton. And when you actually give a blocking antibody, to these, uh, so that you do not have effect of the human antibody on these podocytes, you can see that there is some element of rescue. So this was the first inkling that perhaps we could come in with a blocking antibody and the actually activating antibody that is present um, in, the, in, the, in the context of the disease will not act as well on the podocyte and therefore maybe there will be some protection of the patient from early recurrence. So it could be an attractive immunotherapy for preventing recurrent FSGS. So we went back to the mouse model and again, the mouse model is CD40 plus SUPAR that produces the big influx of proteinuria. So you can see here, this is you actually give the mouse uh, uh, SUPAR plus uh, this, uh, the, uh, uh, the CD40 antibody, they have a lot of uh, proteinuria. But in this graph, just to show you, it's very interesting that this part, we have just given the mouse SUPAR. So there is no uh, actually antibody uh, from the recurrent patient given here. So just super, you can see a huge amount of proteinuria in this mouse, but actually still when you come in with the blocking antibody to CD40, in this you can actually get abrogation of proteinuria in this mouse. And in fact, in this model, when the riser group came in with blocking antibody to super, the effect on abrogation of proteinuria was very little. So this also suggests that there is a synergism between the two molecules, and it's interesting to see that maybe the target to blocking CD40 could be an upstream target that may also prevent superinduced uh, injury to uh, the podocyte. And so this is uh, just to, again, now talk about the kind of trials, exciting trials that we are thinking of doing at UCSF. This is a recent paper that's come out of the RISER group that talks where SUPAR could be coming from. And in fact, it seems to be that SUPAR is probably extra renal in origin and could be coming from some immature myeloid cells that are actually in the bone marrow. So with that, I'll give this back to Dr. Vincenti about how we're taking this data to design new trials. So, you know, this paper brought us back to 15 years ago when uh, Dr. Roberts and I were having a discussion, and he said, well, why don't you do bone marrow transplant in these patients with the kidney? So I, I said, well, you know, we have no proof. So I did bone marrow aspiration in five patients who had recurrent focal and had lost their kidney, were back on dialysis, and we said, well, <coughs> can we reproduce the disease in mice? And when we infused nude mice with the, with the marrow of the of these patients, uh, they all died. And so we, we basically were, uh, ended the experiment, uh, but still it never basically left us. So now we have a fellow who's gonna join us in, um, in July who's interested in participating in some work. And so what we're planning to do as a first step is to get uh, bone marrow aspirate on five patients who are waiting for a transplant. Basically patients who get a focal sclerosis get phoresis, they don't respond, they lose their graft within a year and they're back on dialysis, we don't retransplant them because these are, these are the patients who have almost 100% recurrence rate. And, and so we have accumulated a number of these patients, some of whom are desperate and then send, keep sending emails like, when are you gonna discover something for FSGS? So uh, if indeed we do find a cell that is producing maybe a pathogenic form of SUPAR. Uh, you know, despite our disappointment, and actually there have been maybe five or six papers uh, that have, that did not reproduce any part of the results of uh, RISER original work, um, you know, we want to give it another go. So uh, an, uh, a, a new clinical, the clinical trials of FSGS have by and large been somewhat uh, disappointing and, and difficult. Uh, this is one of the few trials it's going to be uh, uh, initiated by, uh, by Astellas for blocking uh, the recurrence of recurrent FSGS using again an, an anti-CD40 antibody uh, we used to refer to this antibody as a ASKP1240 or blezelumab. It is an anti-CD40, so basically it's based on the concept of the study that uh, Mini has uh, published and described to you. So uh, we would take patients who have primary FSGS, who've had the biopsy documentation of that, 
And the primary objective is to determine whether uh, we can prevent the recurrence. And so just as a quick uh, um, review, that the anti-CD4, they have multiple effects. They participate in co-stimulation of T cells and activation of the T cell. So by binding to CD40, they, they can also uh, contribute to inactivation of co-stimulation. They are very important for B cell activation. So the anti-CD40 antibody binds to the CD40 receptor on B cells, as well as macrophages, uh, which can then uh, are inhibited from uh, uh, producing or releasing uh, destructive cytokines. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the antibody is a human, is a fully human uh, IgG4 antibody, and uh, the patients will be randomized pre-transplant, and then will be randomized to one of two arms. Arm, arm, arm one will get standard of care. Arm two will get standard of care plus uh, blazumabab, and will be um, uh, uh, administering it uh, pre-transplant day seven, 14, 28, 42, up to uh, 12 months. And so, uh, again, the primary endpoint will be whether they get recurrence or requ uh, recurrence of FSGS as determined by nephrotic range proteinuria or the need for uh, plasmaphoresis. Uh, challenges in, in drug development and trials for native kidney disease, uh, FSGS, have been even greater. I just want to give you an example, having participated in several of them. <coughs> this is one of the studies that's going to be published in, in KI using an antibody uh, to TGF beta. So I, you know, I think if when you ask an audience of nephrologists, I have a drug to block FSGS, people get excited, we have tons of patients. And then when you start a trial, those patients disappear. I, you know, I mean, it's just, so it, it, I was the highest enroller in this trial and I got like six patients. And so the company that started this trial wanted to enroll 88. By the time we reached 36, it was two years out, and they lost patience, and they lost interest. And so when the data, when they stopped the, the, the study, it was somewhat early. There was no significant difference between the two groups, those who received the antibody versus those who did not. It's interesting, though, a couple of patients that we put, uh, there is a patient of Mary Brostovich that came fully nephrotic, and after several doses of the anti-TGF beta, proteinuria went away, and Mary B. once in a while sends me a note, and up to this point, the patient has proteinuria less than one gram. <coughs> Unfortunately, with 36 cases, half of them uh, being treated with the antibody, I think it's really m difficult to make a final, a final uh, evaluation of the antibody, but Sanofi lost interest in it, found it very difficult to get patients, and so that's not going anywhere. So another drug is entering clinical trials, and we are in the process of putting the consent through the IRB. Again, this is native kidney disease. And some of you may think, well, what is Flavio doing uh, work with native kidneys? The only reason why we participate in the native kidney is because at some point we hope to bring it to the transplant. So my, my interest is still transplantation, but I think you know maybe we can you know get our foot inside and then try to uh, elicit interest from the drug company to do a trial in transplantation. So sparsentan is a dual uh, endothelial receptor and ARB uh, that has been shown in phase two trials, both in FSGS and in diabetes, to significantly reduce proteinuria. So here again, it's gonna be a 200 uh, patients, age eight to 75. The study is going to be uh, double bind, randomized, prospective. And again, it has to be primary FSGS patients. They have to be nephrotic. <coughs> the only difficult issue with this group is that the patient must have good renal function. So they must have a GFR over 45%. And there's the usual exclusion criteria. And so the coordinator for the study uh, with me is gonna be Crystal Hu. Uh, June Shoji is gonna be a, uh, taking care of the patients with me in the clinic. So we'll be sending you um, notice once we have it approved. So if you have these patients on whom you have exhausted other therapies, we will be happy to take care of them. So, and put them in the study. Finally, a few words about modulating the uh, immune system with uh, 
cellular therapies, uh, I mean, the reason to do that is to minimize immunosuppression. We, at UCSF, we have been somewhat reluctant to do tolerance studies, not because tolerance is not a great goal, it is a wonderful goal, but we have not been uh, totally convinced the conditioning uh, regimens and all the therapy and all the immunosuppression up front. And the current results that we have seen at the few centers that do that really justify the effort. What we prefer and what we are doing both in liver and kidney is to, uh, uh, is to utilize uh, regulatory T cells. And one of the advantage of the regulatory T cells is that it's a more nuanced and more precise and selective approach to control uh, adverse aluminum response. And you don't need conditioning uh, 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 therapy. And therefore, they may be effective, they may not be effective, but there isn't gonna be the penalty that has been paid by several patients who have been in, in uh, the, the classical tolerance studies where you have stem cells, conditioning uh, regimens, uh, they, ha they are at risk of developing graft versus host disease. So we feel this is a tiny bit more sophisticated approach, uh, you know, in tune with sort of the California approach to, you know, diet and good wine and stuff like that. So uh, th this is our study uh, called the TASC, uh, the TREC Adoptive uh, Therapy for Subclinical Inflammation. <coughs> so we had choice to give T-regs at the time of transplants, but with everything else going on, that's going to be a safety study and would have been difficult to get a signal of efficacy. So I thought if we did a study, and this is uh, supported by the NIH, we take patients who at six months on protocol biopsy have inflammation, we randomize them to either stand of care, usually we don't treat subclinical inflammation, or we infuse them with poly, uh, polyclonal T-regs or antigen reactive T-Rex, the antigen specific T-Rex. And then two weeks later, we biopsy them. And when we are uh, expanding the T-Rex in ex vivo, uh, we add deuterium, which is incorporated in the glucose and incorporated in the T-Rex. And we actually can, can detect those. So actually we can follow the cells in the blood and when they go to the kidney. And therefore we can get an efficacy uh, signal. Are these kidneys actually going to the kidney? Uh, are these cells going to the kidney? And do they get rid of the effector cells? And can we find them in, in, the, in, the, in the blood? And this is a procedure. Polyclonal expansion is much simpler. We get a unit of blood. We expand, uh, we isolate the T-reg cells. We usually get maybe five to 10 million cells. They can be uh, expanded by 200 folds in in, in non in non immunosuppressed patients, uh, they can be expanded even more. So anyway, they go through expansion. Then we isolate the T-regs and and we infuse them in the patients. The donor reactive or the donor specific T-regs are a tiny bit more complicated because we have to expose them to donor antigens. So we have to take the B cells from the donor. We have to activate the B cells and then we have to grow the T-reg cells in the presence of B cells and then also uh, have them uh, expanded polyclonally and then isolated and infused. So it's, it's more uh, involved. The question here though is that, are antigen specific T-regs more effective than polyclonal? And, and this is an important question because one would be much simpler and the other much more complex. And we hope that this study may actually prove uh, the point and so we have several centers that are participating in this, uh, in, this, in this study. This is the first group of patients that we did with polyclonal uh, TREG infusions. And what we find here compared to patients who have type one diabetes that are, uh, that are undergoing the same polyclonal TREG infusions, that we can detect the infused TREGs in the blood. And so as we do the studies, we'll see whether we can detect them also in the kidney. So now I want to move the last few minutes to discuss precision medicine <coughs> in, all right. Oh, the slide doesn't show. So, you know, personalized medicine or individualized medicine is not, it's not precision medicine. For example, if uh, individualized medicine is in transplantation, we're doing it right now. Somebody non-sensitized, we induce them with uh, anti-L2 antibody. Highly sensitized, we give them thymoglobulin. 
If they have low-level uh, DSA, we give them IVIG. For precision medicine, uh, you need actually molecular markers, you need uh, uh, biomarkers, and you utilize those to select therapy or to modulate therapy. And that's where in this area of precision medicine has been applied very successfully in oncology, but not yet in, in transplantation. And if the drug that uh, comes to mind where one could potentially apply precision medicine is belatazeb. <coughs> this is the data from the phase three study, whereby patients who were treated with belatazeb versus cyclosporine were followed for seven years, and the belatazeb patients had significant better graft outcome than those who were on cyclosporin. And the GFR, of course, they were on a CNI-free regimen, and we presented this data to you before. The GFR was significantly higher than those patients on cyclosporin uh, over the seven years, and uh, patients on belatacep did not develop donor-specific antibodies because of the mechanism of action of belatacep. So all this is great. The only problem is that initially, Patients on belatacep have higher rates of acute rejection. And frequently, when these rejections occur, they are nasty rejection. Uh, they can be associated with vasculitis. They need much more therapy. They need thymoglobulin. And therefore, the patients can then become over-immunosuppressed at greater risk of PTAD. And so the question, can we apply precision medicine to, to belatacep? And can we use biomarkers uh, to to basically uh, guide our therapy uh, in these patients. All right, can you? I don't know, the, the slides haven't come through. Uh, I don't know if this, the next one? Okay, maybe this, oh good, yeah. all right. Good. So one of the tests that we're using and which was developed by Minnie uh, when she was at Stanford before coming to UCSF is KSOR. And uh, the test has been approved and we are still going through the uh, process of finding clinical utility in the context of uh, uh, clinical care at, uh, of the transplant patients that you see. Go ahead. Thank you. So uh, this is published. This was published in uh, PLOS Medicine as well as in the American Journal of Transplantation and um, about a decade of work using uh, um, microarrays to actually look at blood samples that were taken from um, hundreds of patients who were matched with biopsies uh, led to the discovery of about 17 genes that were modeled, and I won't go through the process of discovery, but suffice to say that these genes are highly expressed in activated monocytes. Uh, we believe that uh, the, the coordinated signal from all of these genes uh, can be uh, put into an algorithm that can provide an immune risk score of the risk of that patient uh, developing an acute rejection weeks to months after uh, this test has been run. Uh, from the data so far, we have about 1,000 patients that have been run uh, using these PCR-based um, assays, and we call it the kidney solid organ response test, or KSORT. Um, uh, basically, this, this test can be positive when at a point where a patient can still have a normal serum creatinine. Um, so that means it can predate the onset of clinical graft dysfunction. Um, so one of the ways that we're going to try and test it is to really screen patients and assess their uh, risk of not just rejection, but also assess their risk of being, not risk, but their safety index, so immune quiescence, because the assay has a very high negative predictive value, uh, which is uh, in, in the high 90%. So this assay basically across these genes, it uses across the 17 genes, it creates a set of different models. It creates, uses randomly 12 genes out of the 17 to create 13 different models. Uh, why we did this is a long story, but at the end of the day, you actually want uh, confidence that uh, essentially this set of genes, because individual genes can actually change expression uh, in different patients, um, even though we've controlled them very tightly for their confounding influence by immunosuppression and demographics, these differences do exist and are difficult to explain, but in this computerized algorithm, um, it actually will, if uh, more than, if all, all 13 genes will actually, uh, 13 models actually predict that the patient has rejection 
uh, based upon vectors that we've used to predict whether it's rejection or no rejection, uh, then that's a very high risk that the patient is more is is uh, has got this strong signal of a monocyte activation in the peripheral blood that could predate acute rejection. So the way the model is done, if you have a score of anywhere from plus 9, 10, 11, 12, or 13, that's a high risk for acute rejection. And conversely, if actually none of the models match or essentially less than, or more than nine models predict that the uh, patient does not have rejection, so if your score is minus 9, minus 10, minus 11, minus 12, or minus 13, then we feel that the, the patient is very low risk for rejection. Just like the breast cancer test that Genomic Health floated, where it has not just a yes and a no, but there's also maybe, in this assay also we have created a high risk, a low risk, and an indeterminate, which means that sometimes the assay will come across and uh, not be able to give you a result. So if there is clinical concern, uh, then the assay can be repeated. Um, so this is uh, basically the, uh, the assay was run in the steroid, no steroid NIH trial. This was a pediatric kidney transplant trial in 120 patients uh, in 12 different U.S. programs. And you can see, uh, I think most uh, importantly is I think what we emphasize is that the specificity of this assay is actually very high. And since then it's been run in an adult kidney transplant trial where the specificity actually stays very high in the, in the high 90s. And I think what I was just trying to say is on top we can see uh, this is basically a cartoon of a serum creatinine showing that it can be quite stable, but you can see that the K-sort assay, these are mean and standard deviations of the scores uh, that are actually plotted with their percent uh, of uh, risk score for rejection uh, in a zero to 100 percent scale. And you can see that you can have these scores start to rise even before there's any rise in the serum creatinine. And on the red bar is when biopsy-proven uh, acute rejection is confirmed, showing that actually if you were to move back potentially three to four months before you confirmed rejection by biopsy, you may have been able to pick it up by the blood test. So we hope that at UCSF, especially for the Bellatasa patients, which we think are probably the most uh, immune privileged over time, because now we, we can see that their graph function is excellent. Uh, in fact, they have very low to absent, really, risk of acute rejection long term. Uh, the seven-year graft survival uh, data from the New England Journal is very exciting. What we're trying to do is essentially take this population first and try and put them on this bell-shaped curve where we think most of them are actually going to be doing fine. But few of them, maybe if there is either adherence issues or perhaps other problems or there's an intercurrent infection that in, uh, increases the risk of rejection, that they could actually move in their case sort scores into the red dots, which is the high risk, or if they actually conversely move to the left, which is the blue dot, which means they have very low risk of rejection, we could potentially, and uh, Flavi will present how we're going to use this data to potentially um, optimize immunosuppression for these patients. Um, and maybe I can just tell an anecdote. We just had a precision medicine uh, Bella clinic yesterday where a patient showed up who, was, who had actually stopped his Bella Tacit and his MMF. Actually, uh, was on the very low side, but I won't go into the details, but I think these kind of assays can allow us to stratify these patients better. This. Okay. So we are, uh, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go yeah. ahead. No, you can oh. do that. So uh, we are actually running a trial at UCSF. It's called the PRISM study, uh, where we're actually taking highly sensitized patients. I mean, we're running this assay sequentially over time to see if we can actually predict the onset of acute rejection in a group of patients who's, of course, more prone to develop acute rejection because they are highly sensitized. Um, and this is just very preliminary data. Uh, this is only presenting the performance of the assay prior to transplantation, because we've already got a lot of data that we've presented after transplantation, and we haven't unblinded the data for the post-transplant results as yet. But we actually looked at the pre-transplant data in a subset of patients. So there are 108 patients that have completed enrollment. This is a subset of data on 69 patients. You can see these are all highly sensitized. 58% um, have a CPRA of greater than 90%, uh, with a mean CPRA of about 87.6%, and the serial case sort assays are on pre-transplant, and I'll show you a little bit of interim data on the pre-transplant, but they've also been run at serial points post-transplant, and these uh, all patients have biopsies at six months or for indication. <clears throat> 
And you can see uh, that uh, the, uh, the pre-transplant case or interim results show that in fact, when we actually ran the assay, they predicted high risk in about 22% of these patients, low risk in about 70% of these patients, and indeterminate in about uh, 6%. And those are the kind of numbers that we see in the post-transplant. We see about 10 to 15% of the uh, patient sample have an indeterminate score. Uh, interestingly, if you had a low-risk case odd score prior to transplantation, uh, there seemed to be a, a much higher predic uh, prediction of these patients not developing acute rejection in the first six months post-transplant. So when we looked at the data, these numbers came out to about 80 percent. And uh, this high-risk case sort in about 12 cases uh, were correlated with biopsy diagnosis, which was only seen in biopsies with injuries. So when you looked at the post-transplant in the small, uh, small cohort, you could see that presence of the high-risk case sort prior to transplant actually did correlate with presence of uh, rejection after transplant in that first six-month period. And low risk case sort in about 35 cases correlated with biopsy diagnosis with about 28% of them being no rejection and seven of them having borderline changes. But none of the patients who had biopsy confirmed BAMF graded acute rejection actually fell into the low risk case sort category. So I'll, I'll leave this yeah, to the slide. Thanks. So we'll, we'll just move on this. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the reason to do the study again is to. Uh, help us in the future uh, determine how much immunosuppression are these highly sensitized patients will require over the long term. And if we have a test, a biomarker at the beginning like KSOR, that tells us this patient, despite they having a lot of HLA antibodies, they are at low risk of rejection, then we don't have to keep them on very intensified immunosuppression very long. And these are the patients that can develop BK viremia, BK nephropathy. So it's a way to um, try to um, um, uh, moderate uh, your immunosuppression on the basis of the needs of the, of the patient. Uh, and, and having the biomarker upfront um, determine how much immunosuppression the patients need initially, and then being able to have a biomarker that can guide your management post transplant would be very helpful. <coughs> now, coming back to the uh, to the Bella Tasep, uh, uh, we we did a study in 20 patients, trying to understand how we could apply precision medicine. And one of the things we know about Bella Tasep, it's great for uh, naive T cells, but memory cells tend to be resistant to uh, to Bella Tasep. So, in these 20 patients, we have taken blood uh, before the transplant. And uh, we have run a whole slew of uh, uh, repertoires for, uh, for memory cells. And so there are some memory cells that have been associated uh, by other uh, investigators with rejection on Belatase. And this is, a hopefully it will appear, but this is the initial uh, um, review of the data and shows that a subgroup of CD <coughs> CD8 cell which are CD57 positive and PD1 negative, tend to be higher pre-transplant uh, in patients who have rejection on Bella as compared to patients who do not have rejection. Now, what are these cells? These are, uh, term, uh, these are, um, uh, uh, um, these are a group of uh, memory cells uh, that do not have a PD1 receptor. Now, the PD1 receptor is a check is a checkpoint inhibitor basically pathway, and therefore it checks the activation of the T cells, so the T cell doesn't keep getting activated. And so we like to to refer to them as unconstrained effectors. Once they get activated, it's hard to to stop them. <coughs> and so if you have a, an, a great number of these cells, of these cells pre-transplant, and you treat the patient with uh, belatase, these are the patients that potentially could be. Uh, at risk for rejection. So the first application of persisting medicine in the future would be to get to profile uh, the uh, T cell subset of the patient pre-transplant, decides on whom, who are the patients who will be sensitive to belatasep, who are the patients who have cells who will be resistant, and to avoid those patients, this way they can get all the benefits of therapy without having uh, the risk of early rejection. 
Now, beyond Belataze, what are we planning in terms of studies? And can we improve on, on Belataze as a co-stimulation blocker? And the answer is that possibly, yes, with an antibody to the CD28 uh, receptor. <coughs> so the me mechanism, sorry for the cough, but uh, I've had a cold uh, for quite a while now. So Belataze, the mechanism of action is that it binds to CD8086, and by the doing that, it interferes with the activation of the CD28 receptor on T effector cells, which is great. The problem is, by, by binding to the ligands, you also inhibit the interaction between the ligands to the negative receptor, meaning CD, CTL4 and PDL1. So you're, you're, you're inhibiting the activating, but you're also blocking the inhibiting uh, uh, pathways. So if you were just to block the activating pathway and allow the inhibiting pathway to take the effect, you would get much more effective immunosuppression. The other issue is that the Treg cells, to function well, require signaling through the CTL4 and, and uh, uh, <coughs> PTL1 receptor, and therefore blocking the, uh, the ligands will prevent that. And so, and so uh, if we were to be able to actually directly target the uh, CD28 receptor, we would be able to allow the free interaction of the ligands with the inhibitory pathways and while blocking the activating pathway. And we also would allow the T-Rex to have full functionality. And therefore, ideally at least, this would be the best approach. And we have some grants and we hope to be able to, to, be, to get the drug and compare the effect of anti-CD28 to belatacept in the future. So uh, in conclusion, uh, clinical research in kidney transplantation is challenging because it's difficult to improve the traditional primary efficacy endpoint of acute rejection. When you have an acute rejection of 10%, you, you can't power studies to improve on that. And I don't think many drug companies are willing or interested in coming up with drugs that are going to that will likely improve long-term outcome and have to uh, persist with the trial uh, for five to seven years. For example, with the Belatasa trial, uh, the phase three trials were conducted up to seven years to show full efficacy. There are many unmet needs in transplantations that still require breakthrough clinical trials. Delay graph function, uh, you've heard the presentation by Dr. Raj. There are patients who have so many antibodies that you can never match them. So good desensitization agents is not available. That's one of the reasons why we have not at UCSF been convinced that that's a good pathway. Uh, treatment of AMR is not satisfactory. Uh, and ultimately, extending graft half-life uh, is what we are, we're after. And this is you know, one of the more challenging uh, uh, drugs to develop because you need the long-term uh, follow-up. And f of course, a cure for FSGS is within reach. It's, well, it looks like it's been forever within reach, uh, but I think it requires much more investment and engagement by drug companies. And, and, and this has not occurred, frankly. They start the trial, they get excited, and then they see that uh, the tons of patients that they have been promised uh, are not surfacing and not entering clinical trial and there have been several trials that have been uh, premature, prematurely discontinued because of that. But I think if we start to understand the true pathophysiology of FSGS and we can tailor therapy accordingly, uh, that uh, will uh, finally be the day when uh, we can treat it effectively and prevent the recurrence. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy and many to answer any questions that you may have. <laughs>